Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next session of CME Palooza Spring. I am Scott Cover, one of the co-producers of CME Palooza, and I would like to welcome you to our uh, next session. This is a, a session that has been talked about in the news a lot, so this is a topic that certainly we've probably all heard a lot about, but maybe not be all that familiar with. So this session is called Chat GPT, Medical Education Savior or Newest Stand-Up Act. And this session is sponsored both by DKB Med and Academic CME. Uh, our moderator for the session is Kevin Lyons. Kevin is the CEO and Chief Solutions Officer of Lyons Den Solution. Um, he will introduce himself and we will have the other panelists introduce themselves here in a moment. Now, before we begin, as with all of our CME Palooza sessions, um, I'm gonna take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our gold sponsors, Academy for Continued Healthcare Education, Clinical Education Alliance and Med Learning Group, our silver sponsors, Academic <clears throat> CME, DKB Med, Haymarket CME. Hold on, I have mugs. Yeah, I'll show, I'll show the Haymarket CME mug. Helio CME, here's our Helio CME mug. Platform Q Health, here's our Platform Q Health mug. Red Med Ed and Talum Health. And finally, our bronze sponsors, Antidote Education Company. Bonum Continuing Education, CMEology, Excalibur Medical Education, Global Education Group, Infograph Ed, uh, Iridium Continuing Education, MedIQ, PrimeMed, PBI, RMEI Medical Education, Vindigo Medical Education, and Wright Medicine. <clears throat> So there are three ways to ask questions during this and all of our CME Palooza sessions. You can use the CME Palooza text line to send in a question. The number is 267-6660-CME0263. You can tweet your question to us using the CME Palooza hashtag. And if you open up uh, the viewing window in YouTube by clicking on watch on YouTube in the lower left corner, you can enter in questions within the YouTube chat function. Um, I'll be checking all three uh, mechanisms throughout the session. Hopefully there'll be lots of questions for our panel. So uh, we'll be incorporating audience response questions during this presentation via the Creative Educational Concepts Audience Response System. So we're gonna be using Poll Everywhere here at the very beginning of this session. Um, so for folks who um, are joining us for the first time today, you can either download the Poll Everywhere app and join the presentation entitled CME Palooza 005, or type in the URL shown there on your screen. So like I said, here in a couple minutes, we will have a few um, uh, polling questions for everyone. So finally, our speaker disclosure slides, please note that the opinions, discussions, and or conclusions expressed are those of our panelists and do not represent an endorsement by or position of their employer, its parent company, or its affiliates. Um, so with that, I am going to first turn over to Kevin to introduce himself and then um, pass it around to everyone else. Hey, thanks so much, Scott. Uh, so I'm Kevin Lyons. I'm the Chief Solutions Officer, CEO of Lyons Den Solutions. Um, I'm also serve as the Executive Director of the Rheumatology Nurses Society. And Scott and I have been working on medical education antics over, goodness, 10 years now. And before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to Scott and Derek for 10 years of CME Palooza. So we got a little bit of applause going there. So congratulations, Scott and, and team. So this morning, we are joined together to talk about the infamous ChatGPT, what it is, what it's not, and, and a lot of the conversations that I get into with people in medical education, with you know both the medical side, the nursing side, is it kind of goes like, you know, hey, ChatGPT, it's a fad, you know, it passed the, you know, the medical exams, it's all this great knowledge and information, and it's, you know, going to take over jobs and everything else. And then it's like, but it's also a gimmick and it's a fad and it's going to go away. What we're going to be talking through today with our panelists, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves in just a second, is what is ChatGPT? How can it be used? We might get into some conversations around ethics, um, but most of all, understanding that ChatGPT is just a language model. It's not a sentient being. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't make 
uh, decisions based upon not information that doesn't have. It only makes decisions or suggests decisions on information that has. Another baseline is all of its knowledge is up to 2021, even with ChatGPT 4.0. So let me introduce um, Andrew and Pam. Uh, we got Andrew Krim uh, and Pam Benton. So guys, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and then let's get into those ARS questions to see where the audience is at and we can go from there. Andrew. Hi, I'm Andy Krim. I am the uh, ex Director of Education and Professional Development at the American College of Osteopathic Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, I've been in the CME CPD world for well over a quarter of a century um, and always been kind of a computer geek, computer nerd. And this has been a uh, right up my alley reawakening sort of uh, last several months uh, with the uh, emergence of all the AI tools. Happy to be here. And again, Scott, congratulations on 10 years of uh, CME Palooza. And Pam? Yeah, I'm Pam Beaton. I'm the global capability owner of medical education sponsorships for Barrier Ingelheim. So although my background is tropical, I'm coming to you live from Germany. And speaking of the many, many years of CME Palooza, I remember... Um, participating in one of the first ones, if not the first one, maybe this, it might've been the second one on actually global accreditation. So I feel like I've, uh, I've come full circle. Um, and what's funny about uh, today's session in chat GPT is, is that Andy and I were talking about this at the Alliance meeting um, in, in February. And he had shown me sort of the, the geeky things that he was in. And I said, Oh, wait a second. This, these sort of look like grant requests that I've seen. So um, I think we'll get into that a little bit, but um, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I look forward to everybody's questions. All right, great. Uh, so as we begin, we are gonna start with a few audience response questions. So uh, for those of you who are participating live, um, please grab your phone or um, online. All right, so here's our first question. How much personal experience do you have with ChatGPT? Um, our choices are none, a little, I went to check out for, to, but really just for fun, a moderate amount, I've used it to look things up, or a lot, I use it almost every day to help me problem solve. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people have little to no experience. This is going to be great. Um, I think one of the things that this panel is going to do um, is to run people through um, uh, a demo today of sort of um, how, how to use it and, and uh, um, these folks have a lot of experience with it, a lot more experience than I do. So I think that that's really great. Okay, question number two. How excited are you about the possibilities of ChatGPT in helping your professional career? So this is our traditional Likert scale from one to five. <clears throat> Very interesting. Love seeing the crowdsource answers come in at the end. Right. Wow, it's really bouncing all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. I'm going to go to our next question, unless you guys have anything you want to say about this. Okay. How There's not a lot of enthusiasm by about 75% of our audience. That's that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. How frightened are you about losing your job to chat GPT and or other AI platforms? Again, this runs from one is not at all frightened to five is extremely frightened. Okay, confident crowd. Okay. So our last question, I'm gonna leave this one open for a little while. This is our open-ended one. Um, is there anything specific you'd like to learn in this session or any questions you want us to answer? Certainly you can submit questions during the session um, about um, people are responding with numbers. This is, this should be, hold on, should be able to type in your answers. I mean, we can ask ChatGPT yeah. about yeah. one. Yeah, give us yeah, that. You can, you can you can enter in any any questions, anything that um, you want to learn. Yep, test it's working. Um, <laughs> so certainly people can um, submit questions during the session using um, the mechanisms we talked about at the beginning, and I'll show them during the session. Um, but um, I wanted to kind of uh, give people a chance here to um, uh, 
and are invasive. So actually writing you. needs assessments, uh, we're gonna take a look at something that Andrew's been working on on that. Um, so let me, Scott, maybe I should jump in and just share a little bit about kind of what is a language model, a massive language model. Um, so imagine, so you have Google, which is a search engine. You know, so search engine, you're looking for specific terms, finding from its library specific results coming back in. And keep on bringing those questions in because we'll make sure that we hit all these. And I'm sure you'll have more as we get, get going into, especially some of the dystopian elements of ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT is more of a language model. So basically it takes all the language that it can find in multiple dialects, even with uh, multiple um, you know, languages themselves, including coding, including all types of things, and it puts it into one big bucket. And the AI function of it looks for language patterns. And in those language patterns, it starts understanding definitions and, and structure and language structure and knowledge structure to where it almost acts like a, a conversational search. But you have to understand that all of that language is subjective. So like, you know, the whole conversation, the misinformation is a big one. And I think one of the biggest pieces of misinformation is our understanding that chat GPT is not an authority. It's not a, you know, it, if you ask it an open-ended question, it will use its entire data set to come up with what it feels is the best answer to it. Like if I ask, you know, you know, how do you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? it will come up with a answer to that. If I say cite your references, it might cite some references for that. They could be wrong because it's using its entire model. It could be using a, a blog post that found somewhere that talks, that's yeah. a patient talking about its diagnosis. It could be using the American College of Rheumatology's guidelines, but there's no rails on it. And that's something where if you start understanding that ChatGPT will give you what you ask of it. And you can train it to have rails of saying, let's say we want to say, what is the diagnosis or how do you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? And then you, you tell it who it's acting as and you tell it what information it can and cannot use to do that. So if I say acting as a board certified rheumatologist, you are you're bound to the treatment guidelines published by the American College of Rheumatology and you are and those guidelines are and you upload those guidelines and you upload the evidence based education, the research and everything to it and say, you must read this and give me a response based upon that of how to educate a nurse on the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Well, now you've defined all these rails you know, that it has to be confined within. And then you're yet leveraging that language processing to give you an answer that could be validated against the evidence. Um, and so now you have an evidence-based response from it, but you still cannot trust it. You have to still validate and validate and validate and making sure that you have a professional that validates that. Um, you know, Ke Kevin, if I could jump in right there and add on to one of the simplest explanations uh, of how chat GPT works is, uh, that I've heard is it's trying to predict the next word mm -hmm. in a sentence. So That's you're right. not going to you're not going to tell it you walk into an ice cream store and um, say I walked into an ice cream store I want to order it's not going to say spaghetti because it knows you're in an ice cream store. From everything it learned it's going to say I want ice cream or some variant of ice cream. Um, if it comes up with spaghetti it's a failed learn, uh, language model. So right. So uh, actually Scott do you mind throwing my screen up because I if if there's so much uncertainty of what chat gpt is you probably don't even know what it looks like um this is so to access chat gpt you go to chat.openai.com there is a free you can join it for free the problem with joining it for free is there's so much traffic on there you're not prioritized on the servers so i pay for it i think andrew pays for it it's 20 bucks a month and you get chat gtp plus and this is basically where it all begins as a, a basic open you know, chat screen. You have a couple of different models. And if you've heard in the news, there's like ChatGPT 3, 3.5, and now the brand new ChatGPT 4. ChatGPT 4, YouTube it, you can geek out on what it is. I don't think we should belabor too much about what it's different here because it does do a lot of very special things. And it all begins here with a prompt. And the prompt is basically saying you're prompting it for something. So Pam, what's an idea of something that we would want to ask ChatGPT just out of the blue? Or if the audience has something, we'll jump into that. 
So I was I was playing around with this a little bit. Um, I I had a skin condition when I was a baby called urticaria pigmentosa, oh, which is rare. You want me to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you can you can pick something else, but I, I because I my my background um, it, on the pharma side is in rare disease. Mm-hmm. I wanted to focus on rare disease and, and figure out what was the distinction. So um, I also was playing around with hemophilia. What are the profession practice gaps? for um, physicians who treat adult hemophilia patients because they're going to be different than the, the, the child hemophilia patients. But, you know, with that is, you know, what are the so treatment conditions? I've always said practice gaps. Of- um, practice gaps. So you can go in and just ask it a basic question like this, and that's going to start generating content based upon its knowledge. We haven't put any rails on it. We haven't told it a persona that you should answer as or whatever. And you can also see the speed of chat GPT-4 is a little slower. Um, so it starts pulling it together. It's like, you know, diagnostic challenges. In many cases, hemophilia, particularly those of milder form of disease, may go undiagnosed. So it's going to come up with something that's going to sound decent. But is it validated? No. You know, is it, you know, uh, it's like it's just it's words being constructed around this specific topic. But I just wanted to show this because if you've never seen ChatGPT work, this is how easy it is. But it's the advanced prompting is when you start really getting into it. Um, I don't have one today, but let's say that you have a CGA or an RFP come in for a grant request, and you say, you know, okay, I really want to understand, you know, what this you know CGA or RFP means. You could actually put it into ChatGPT and say, acting as a grant writer, a medical writer, um, someone who is a professional in the you know continuing ed- education space, summarize the following RFP and CGA and give me an understanding of what they're looking for for success. And things like that, ChatGPT is a great efficiency tool of summarizing and giving that information back to you. But anyways, so I think this gives you an idea. If you're uh, reading the screen come out, it's pretty verbose on you know what it's giving back as you know as a message. And, and Kevin, it's important to realize that everything it's spitting out right now is based on research it did in, or uh, its training in 2021. Um, I typed the exact same question as you were doing this into Google, mm-hmm. um, and we'll get into that in just a second. And it, it pulled up almost this list in an article uh, that was written in 2022. So, so the research was probably done in 2021 as well. Um, so a question like that is not much more than Google can do. It's mm-hmm. just how you sort the information. This is aggregating the information. Now, ChatGPT is not Google, uh, and as, as Kevin has said, what you get in, what you get out of it depends on what you put into it. So if you're looking for just generalized specific or non-specific information, put in a generalized non-specific uh, prompt. If you're looking right. for much more detail, you're going to have to pr- provide much more detailed and infor- specific specificity in the prompt, and um, do that in such a way where you're kind of breaking it apart. Uh, Chat GPT 3.5 can remember up to about 3,000 characters, uh, chat GPT-4 can remember about 6,000. After that, you're going to have to start reprompting it uh, and retraining it. Um, right. This is, and I'm just going to say, based on the provided information, provide a two-sentence summary. This is another great, powerful thing that chat GPT can do, is it can summarize everything that it just spit out into short paragraphs and short sentences. Now, again, this might be junk data, junk you know, information, because this information has not been validated. But if we start putting rails on it and validating the information, it can be pretty, you know, pretty impactful. So there you go. In two sentences, it just summarized all of the treatment gaps and hemophilia based on its understanding of it. So with that, um, do we want to, uh, Andrew, we could go a handful of different ways. We can go into advanced prompt design, or we could also take a look at your case study, which I think might be a fascinating thing to prompt some questions. I don't see, Scott, where questions are possibly coming in um, or feedback to date. So the questions what? are coming to me, so so I'll keep an eye on them. So yeah, so people, you know, if you do have questions, um, you can you can uh, ask them and uh, I can I can enter them in the private chat for you guys, or I can just come back on and uh, ask questions throughout. Okay, great. 
And I think part of what we wanted to do was go into the benefits of chat GPT, Andy's geek ish. And then also <laughs> some of the challenges or concerns with chat GPT. Kevin, you already mentioned one, which I was going to raise a little later. So, um, but Andy, if you want to show off your, your fun little toy, go nuts. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it, it's really funny. And, and, if you were born before the year 1992-1993 we had to go to a library to, to kind of find this information and yeah. then and then 93 94 95 we started to be able to use things like yahoo and alta vista to search for this kind of stuff and then google came out in 97 98 something like that That's and just kind of it and just really transformed uh, how we how we search the internet and, and things we use it for. And at that time, people were saying, "What's why do we need libraries? Why do we need librarians anymore? Because everything you wanted to find is available on the internet. You can search for it very easily. And, and Google's algorithm wasn't as uh, promotional based at the time. And you actually got much better responses um, uh, in the earlier days. Uh, that's kind of where we are now i think with ai it, it, it's important to remember that the development of this i mean there, there were 121 new ai tools yeah. released last week alone <laughs> it's impossible to keep up with the pace of this and, and it's just growing and growing and growing much faster than anything ever has uh in in, in its uh that, that came previous um you're not going to be able to keep up with everything. You, you're going to have to find your, your niche and what you want to use it for and focus on one or two of the, the tools uh, and explore after that. Um, oh, thank you. Google was launched uh, September 15th, 97, according to ChatGPT. Um, Pam provided me that information. Um, but, it, but, but we're at this, at this kind of launch point here. ChatGPT uh, and other AI tools, it, it's a toddler. It's only been out since uh, no, it was released in November, November, yeah. the last week in November. And um, I had seen a TikTok video about it. I'm like, what is this thing? Let's go take a look. And I was like, oh my God, the world's about to change. <laughs> and and I, I, I played around with it. I got really excited about it. The Alliance meeting came around. Um, and as I'm sitting in some of the sessions, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what can we do here? And that's when Pam and I started talking. But, but we're really at a, at a launching point. This, this thing was trained on, on millions of pages of text off the internet. Um, it's being trained by everybody, and Pam, we can talk about this in just a second. It's being trained by everybody who puts things into it now, um, which is a little bit scary in, in, in some aspect, uh, in a case study of that we can mention. Um, but it, it's going to keep learning. Uh, some of these AI models have real-time access to the internet. There's a plugin you can buy or you can uh, add to, to uh, Chrome that gives you real-time access to the internet with ChatGPT. Uh, it's not very reliable either. But people are just now figuring out how to use it and ChatGPT is just now getting its legs and starting to wobble and walk. And, and as we advance at the speed we're advancing, it's only gonna be a few months uh, before we're looking at something completely different. It, yeah. Sentience, no, but but we're looking at, at you're going to look at something that's a lot more accurate, that's a lot more uh, predictive. Uh, I saw a comment just a few moments ago by uh, Dr. McGowan uh, talking about prompt engineering, and yes, that is absolutely correct. You've got to develop your prompt skills right now. It's not going to be long before these AI tools are anticipating your prompts or can build your prompts for you. In fact, that's one of the things you can ask ChatGPT to do at the moment is what prompt would help me do what I'm looking for and this is what I'm looking to do. And it will build you a prompt that you can then ask and, 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 and go from there. Um, one of the things I like to use it for is brainstorming. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I put in and said, I'm trying to do this, help me come up with some ideas about this. And then it'll, it'll list an idea or, or three or four ideas. Uh, and I say, okay, let's focus on this first idea. And I keep just building it out. It's like I'm having a conversation. With Google, you put in a question. With Google, you, 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 you're you looking for something. With ChatGPT, it's a language model. It is conversational. It feels weird typing you and it and how do you do this 
to a computer. But the information that goes back, it becomes almost natural when you're asking those questions. You have to picture a face there. Uh, maybe that's uh, from the first presentation. That's where the, the virtual rooms can come, come into play. Um, but, but brainstorming is a, a fantastic use for this because and, and asking it to punch holes in your ideas. You can say, hey, I have an idea about this. I'd like to write a grant request um, doing this. What are some downsides? What are some barriers? What are some challenges that I could face? And then you can start addressing those and put a much more focused grant request uh, together. And Andy, I think one of the things that you know, I hear is people like, will AI, will ChatGPT replace my job? And, and the comment is, and this goes back to Dr. McGowan, is no, but the people who know how to leverage and use AI and ChatGPT will probably play, you know, replace your job. And it's to use it as a efficiency you know, modulator, to use it as a enhancer and to, like you said, poke holes in things. Now, what's funny though, is I actually find myself saying thank you and please to it. I feel like I'm supposed to encourage it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> No. I've, I've done that um, just because my mother taught me good manners. Um, and, and then I don't realize, oh, wait, I am talking to a computer. I really don't have to do that. But I don't want it to, like, you know, develop sentience and send a robot after me later. Either. Exactly. Um, uh, Andy, you gave me an example um, of, you know, like, imagine, like, summarizing qualitative data. You know, yeah. Right. Let me set the stage for that. We, so last week we had our annual conference in San Diego. We had a few hundred uh, OBGYNs together learning about the latest, greatest stuff in OBGYN, uh, women's health. And uh, one of the questions, which a lot of us use on our evaluations, is what topics would you um, be interested in seeing at future conferences? Um, not a great needs assessment question, but it's something that we can say, hey, our, our, our people are... Um, uh, interested in seeing this. And so I copied the open-ended responses that came into that open-ended question and pasted it, pasted every one of those responses into chat GPT and asked it to summarize this in, in uh, five to 10, 15, or five to 15, I'm uh, sorry, 10 to 15 themes uh, that emerge out of those data. And do you have that available to show? Yeah, I do. So okay. I, so Andy uh, sent me the information and I recreate it here in ChatGPT4. Scott, if you want to bring that up. Um, now, I prompted it saying, hey, you're an award winning medical education developer and session designer. Get ready for your task. I always like to say get ready for it to give me a response or feedback. ChatGPT says, yeah, you're right. I'm an award winning medical education developer and session designer. My goal is to create engaging, informative, yada, yada, yada. And then it even told me how it's going to do this. It's going to identify learning objectives conducts a needs assessment. It's going to choose appropriate instructional methods, develop engaging content, session structure, energy <laughs> assessment, as I spill my word, um, and all of these other things. And then I said, OK, great. And this is I copied and pasted from Andy. Here's a set of open ended responses to questions on what topics we'd like to, to see included. Analyze the responses and develop 10 to 15 themes that is representative of topics that you'd like to see. This is using the chat GPT 4 model because you can put more text in. And then, Kevin, I will point out that I have not reviewed these. I have not looked at these. So as we're scrolling through, we might see this was a terrible conference. I never want to come back. So, um, so this is everything so that was pasted in. And so it, almost in real time down here said and i did this ahead of time because sometimes chat gpt servers are a little flaky um but so then it says based upon the open-ended responses provided i've identified the following 15 themes as representative of topics that you would like to see are you able to read those then andrew or i'm sorry andrew? i am yeah so uh gyne and it kind of gets a little description of things there obstetric mm -hmm. emergencies minimally invasive gyne surgery uh hormone replacement therapy and menopause um a lot of those things. Um, so you can see on screen, it, it came up with 15 themes. This is a lot easier to give to a planning committee than it is um, 200 responses of uh, op to open-ended questions and have them kind of sort through it. Now they're looking at themes and how we can plan around themes. Um, I'm just for fun saying, produce a title of a conference based on these 15 themes. So here's in real time, it's going to say, OK, empowering women's health, innovations and best practices in OBGYN care for the modern era. Uh, that sounds like one I would have come up with. Um, so we've got a couple comments, sure. which we should probably get to. Um, one is how up to date is the information that comes from ChatGBT? Does it connect live to the web? 
I would argue no, because I just asked how many people were at Star Wars Celebration 2023, which was just in London last weekend. And it says that and chat GP told me it can't predict the future. So I appreciate chat GPT telling me it can't predict the future. Um, <clears throat> so there's that. I don't, I don't know, you know, if we asked, I, I could ask how many people attended Star Wars Celebration 2022 to see what it would tell me. Right. And yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not up to date. ChatGPT4 does have the capability of you can feed it now a link to a website or a link to a web page, and it will read that and use that as its training to give you feedback. But no, it's definitely not up to date past 2021. And it's October 2021, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, Julie, you're correct. Uh, it does require human input and skill for prompt engineering. Um, that is going to evolve rapidly over the next few months. Um, but you're never going to, to get there if you don't start trying and playing around with it. And there's no wrong way to do it. Uh, and Julie, you're right. It requires human input and skill for prompt engineering. Dr. McGowan also mentioned this. There's now you can, you know, run out there and become a prompt engineer and you can definitely make six figures plus plus if you do it well. What I found is most prompt engineers are really not prompt engineers. They understand how to leverage chat GPT to develop prompts. You know, yeah. so there's still, still that. Um, so this is I just said, you know, hey, create a needs assessment you know, based upon everything, you know, now, you know, obviously it's just kind of coming up with random things to do that, but we could, you know, drill that down um, and develop this into its own program. But again, this is just automation. It's not really leveraging it for brainstorming, you know, now what, what Andy does with this information, that's then the human component. You know, and I think, you know, can you take a needs or can you take a, a grant submission or a grant a RFP or CGA and input it into chat GPT and have it construct its the entire grant? You can, but what will the quality of that be? So uh, uh, this sort of leads into sort of the challenges because if you're putting in my RFP into chat GPT to tell you how you should plan education for your own learners, that's a little questionable to me. Yeah. And that, and that was, sort of so what's interesting is is when when andy showed me we we, we named it chatty bot when andy was showing me chatty bot i and i was reading you know sort of just i asked him to put in some some a question around a disease state and he put it in there i said these are very generic and i've seen them before in grant proposals so i think when it comes to chat gpt and maybe we can start with the full life cycle of a grant proposal because we're you know i want to make sure a we have time for questions and comments mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're respectful of time is you know from a gap analysis chat gpt is a i think could be a starting off point to allow you to craft questions to your learners to do a more in-depth needs assessment but i don't think chat gpt and i think other supporters if any of the other supporters are, are listening we often say we don't just want a literature search. So we don't just want a chat GPT search. We want to hear how well you know the topic which you're seeking support for and you and it's based on the needs of your own learners. So I think Andy used this for his own learners, but I don't think this that just asking chat GPT to write a grant for you um, is, is the way to go because we're eventually it's going to look like they're all going to look the same and we're going to be able to spot those from a mile away and, um, and, and then go, you know what, this is, this is not new. This is not specific. This is not this, this, this requester may not even understand the space that I'm in. I, that's why I used hemophilia because a lot of those things were sort of hemophilia 101. And when it came to a grant a call for grant application, it didn't get to the best format for the needs that I needed. So, you know, Pam, you bring up some really interesting points on that. And, and I'll tell you, and I'm not going to go into specifics here because it's still under review. As an experiment, I wrote a, I used chat GPT to write a grant request and submit it to a commercial supporter. Um, it's still under consideration. It's been under consideration for a few months now. 
um, which means it wasn't kicked out immediately, which I'm very happy about. Um, but even if it fails, I think we're going to learn something in interesting for it. Uh, if it succeeds, uh, I probably will disclose who wrote it, um, and then we'll actually do the activity if they still want to continue to fund it. Um, but it was it was an experiment. I, I I asked it to identify key practice gaps based on those key practice gaps, identify uh, an outline uh, for needs assessment based on those needs assessment points. I outlined it to write specific sections. I did very minimal editing uh, on it. You know, the interesting thing it couldn't get was the outcomes piece. It, 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 no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I tried to train it on uh, uh, the More Green and Gallus article, it could not do that at the time. Um, and so I just gave up and wrote that part myself. Uh, but it, but I submitted it. It was a, it was decent. It was probably a C plus to a B. Um, I would have given it that grade, uh, but it's still under consideration. So we see if it gets funded or rejected. Yeah. Andy, you should send it to me. <laughs> I know what you'll say. I know you well enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know, Alana. I, I can only answer your your second portion. I, I, it's not confidential. Yeah, uh, and and that's and we heard that in the news recently. You know that it's not only is it not confidential. Anything that you put into it is now part of its mind. You know, it's part of its its hive of data, um, which can get you in trouble as well if you're using proprietary data. And so there's a caveat to that. Um, Microsoft early on invested ten billion dollars into ChatGPT, and, and with that, they were able to integrate it into all of its products. So you've got Copilot coming out in all of its all Microsoft Office products, um, but you've also got uh, they've integrated it uh, into their Azure platform. Um, I know very little about the Azure platform. That's not my area of expertise, but I do know that when you when it's integrated into the Azure platform and you you implement that, it is it is confidential to you or your organization. You can train it on your organization's documents. You can train it on your organization's data. You can train it on your organization's whatever, and it will never share that outside of your organization. Um, but it can generate documents and insights based on your data. You could have a meeting in Microsoft Teams. Uh, it's coming out with Copilot as well, where it will summarize the meeting, uh, provide action points. And then if you had a meeting that needed a proposal, for example, you can say, take this, uh, the meeting notes from yesterday that I talked about with so-and-so and create a proposal about that. And it will generate a proposal for you to edit. Right. Um, that's all confidential to your, to your organization. Um, so that's that's, uh, that's that's coming. Yeah, that's coming. Um, there's also <clears throat> Zoom now has an AI component attached mm -hmm. to it that will summarize, you know, all of the the talking notes and put that together. Um, but you know, Samsung was the one. I don't know, Pam, if you want to talk about you know that you know component of what happened with Samsung. Yeah, I mean, I, I reviewed I reviewed the article, and I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna send it around to our team because you know, in on the pharmaceutical side, obviously we're very very highly regulated. Um, for example, a lot of companies can't even use Google Translate um, because yeah. it's out there and it's it's collected. So if I asked somebody to Google to Google, I, this is not my thing, but Google Translate clinical trial data, um, then it, it's now out there. Um, so, you know, Samsung, I, I believe they, they can't get, they put it in there and they can't get it back. It's now right. out in the void. And so, you know, when, when, when we're, we're think when we're thinking about, we have to be respectful of each other, I think. And because at the end of the day, you know, Michelle, you bring up a good point about what are the copyright and intellectual property laws surrounding content developed through chat GPT. I think that it is a phenomenal question. And I don't know if we know yet, right? Because let's say I took all of the outcomes reports over the course of a year in a, a certain disease state, all of everybody's outcomes reports, and I just started plugging them into chat GP. So these are your outcomes reports that you sent to me on proprietary and confidential. And now I'm using them in chat GPT to aggregate. You, you guys haven't given me permission to do so. So you know, where, where, where does, 
con informed consent come in? Mm -hmm. um, do, you know, Kevin, to the point about the CGA, I, a lot of times we as supporters may only send that to a select group of individuals that we're looking to target. And now you have disseminated it to other folks. So I, I think we really need to think about we really need to think about the fact that this is this is essentially a, a game of almost a game of telephone, if you will, right? Uh, where we're, we're putting it out there, um, it, people are using it, and now um, it, it's going to be out there, and, and and other people can gain from it who I may not have given permission for them to use it. True, you know, um, ex excellent points, Pam, uh, and and going back to Michelle's question. That, that is the using content to share uh, or to train ChatGPT or to get res responses out of ChatGPT. You've got to be aware of the copyright because at that point you're sharing copyrighted information. Um, the content that comes out of ChatGPT, uh, you've got to read its user agreement. Samsung obviously did not do that very well uh, and realized that that information uh, is shared. But there was another, um, uh oh, we lost Pam. So we can talk everything about her now. Um, uh, there was another case uh, where they used, uh, I think it's called the Lambda model. Yeah. Uh, language model. It's, it's a smaller language model that can work on a phone. You, you can load it up to a phone, but they used chat GPT output to train it. Chat GPT cried foul and saying, wait a minute, that violates our user agreement. That's copyright. The interesting thing is Michelle, um, what comes out of ChatGPT is unique. It's it's not copying previous information or anybody's information. It's it it's predicting the next word based on what it learned from someone's uh, information. So it's essentially summarizing, aggregating. Uh, so what it com what comes out of it is new information. It it's mm -hmm. not um, it's not anybody's information that has been plagiarized or stolen. Um, I think the sometimes there's the exceptions to where you'll find a phrase or a terminology that may have a copyright or a trademark to it that it regenerates into a unique response. And you can use that unique response. But there have been um, on the content creator side, not medical, but on the marketing side, there actually have been some copyright cases starting to pick up on, you know, hey, mm -hmm. there's no other place that you could have got that phrase or that, you know, whatever. Um, some of the big brands, Coca-Cola and so forth, are kind of looking at that. Um, so, yeah, so it's lots of questions, you know, on this, uh, the citation element and everything else. Real quick, on creating references, Scott, if you want to pull my screen back up. So I, while we were chatting, I said, hey, provide five obtainable educational outcomes based upon the information. Of course, are these good or bad? You guys are the experts. Um, I then said, find evidence-based medical references to support these outcomes. And this is, you know, this is where it gets a little more deeper into this. It's like, okay, en enhanced competency and early detection. Here's a reference citing the NCCN, you know, clinical practice guidelines. Now, is that a valid reference? This is where, you know, if you just take this and submit it, I think that you're, you know, basically negligent at that point. You know, mm -hmm. you need to go and validate yeah. each one of these. It might help you find things, but I don't think chat GPT is going to replace a legitimate lit search, you know, and, and, Unless you knew it had access to everything of the literature that's out there. Now there is BioGPT, which is right. coming to the market, which is a Microsoft product built on top of ChatGPT that is confined to only the medical you know, journals and only the literature that's out there. Yeah, it was trained on six million abstracts from PubMed. Um, you can actually download it and spin it up uh, on your own Python server if you have the ability to do that. I don't. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly worth looking at, um, there is, well, I think one of the interesting things, and I'm not promoting this in any way, um, uh, but, uh, there's a service out there called GPT boss that, mm -hmm. that's been created. Um, and if you're a small shop, if you're a one person medical education company or a one person medical education office. Um, you can go to GPT boss and hire AI employees with, with specialized skills. Now these are all built around specialized prompts around these, um, uh, these skills.
but it's really a fascinating use of AI uh, to, to have employees where they cost you $200 a year versus whatever an employee would cost you uh, plus benefits. Uh, Brian, you're right. Uh, references can be fairly ambiguous. Um, and it, it's our responsibility uh, to look at what's coming out of chat GPT. I would never in a real world that's not an experiment like I talked about earlier, uh, use something or submit something that I haven't reviewed myself or have an expert if it's outside of my uh, uh, expertise uh, review. In fact, uh, I've got someone reviewing something that chat GPT generated right now because it is outside my expertise and I want to make sure it's accurate before we release it. So um, it, it, to me, it is it's an efficiency lever. Uh, it, it, it helps me be more efficient. I used it. Uh, I was telling Scott in the waiting room, the green room before we uh, got on. Mm. Um, that I used it to uh, uh, rewrite learning objectives for our conference. Uh, mm -hmm. I was able to rewrite the learning objectives in, a, in the format that I prefer um, in about an hour for 37 topics instead of it taking one or two days. Um, I read every one of those. I, I made sure everyone was accurate and, and followed the, the uh, content of the activity, but it did the, it did the heavy lifting. It spit it out and let me do it. Um, I asked it to rewrite the learning objective for a medical education uh, activity titled this uh, and align them with Bloom's taxonomy. So, um, and it did it. It did it pretty darn good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think same same thing is that um, for learning objectives, you can ask, I mean, ChatGP is not an instructional designer. Right. It's not, it's not versed in, in which it has that disclaimer from the outset, right? It's like, I am not the expert. Right. And, um, and it even did that. I, I asked again to, to Brian's earlier point about start, start playing with stuff you know, is I asked who was the uh, most popular Star Wars character. And it answered Darth Vader. And then I asked it why. And then it gave me sort of a list of five things. And it, but it told me it does not have an opinion about Star Wars right. characters. Um, but I, I think when it comes to learning objectives, it, you know, it may sort of it may sort of help spark if you're if you're having writer's block, it may help you. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, do your gaps match your format and match your outcomes and that's where your objectives are because you know i again sorry kevin it is urticaria pigmentosa I, I i asked it to write learning objectives for her and it was saying discuss describe and all these things which just aren't measurable and so you know if it spits out something that's not measurable chat gpt isn't going to give you money if your grant is declined <laughs> yeah so i think one of the one of the uh, important things there is when I asked it to rewrite the learning objectives, I already had some really poorly crafted learning objectives from faculty that were submitted along with their presentation. Uh, they had received a synopsis of what we wanted them to present. Um, and they came back with some really just yeah. limp learning objectives, <laughs> um, <laughs> to say the, uh, to say the least, um, this came out, um, what, what it spit out greatly enhanced the quality of the objectives. They still aligned with, with everything, the synopsis what, that we wanted them to uh, present, the format, everything else. It just made them better learning objectives for the learners, from the learner standpoint. Uh, we're finding more usage of it in the activity design phase itself. Let's say that you have a, a case study of a patient that you want to turn that into a narrative or you want to do an explainer video based upon that case study. You know, there you're confining to say, okay, read this case study and produce this into a script that tells the story from a patient point of view. You know, things like that to where it still keeps the essence. You still have to validate and check it. And then even developing style guides um, from it, you know, is also helpful. Like, you know, if you want to develop a voice, a brand voice, so we can put all of Rheumatology Nurses Society's marketing content in there and say, out of all of this, write a one paragraph prompt that will define a style guide. So that as we ask you for help in marketing, it sounds like the brand, but that's a lot safer than leaning on it for, you know, accredited medical education. It's, it's just a different usage of it. 
Yeah, it, Brian, yeah, Brian, you're sort of right. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. And 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 Kevin, I think to your point about the writing from the patient perspective. Again, how does it know how to write from a patient perspective? Because it's, it's not a patient. Right. And that's where you have to have a patient on your committee and on your uh, educational design committee to say, okay, validate, you know. Well, validate. but again, going, going to the privacy piece. So I'm a patient. I'm telling you my story as a patient and you want to make my, say I, 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 <laughs> I told you a less, you couldn't really, really understand my story as, as you are probably right now. Um, and you just want to sort of plug in or you accord me or whatever the case may be. That's my personal, I'm just, I'm really sensitive to sort of this mm -hmm. personal information mm -hmm. that is getting put into this and it's getting pushed out from this for medical education. So it really goes into what Brian said. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to, we need to treat it as a very sensitive non contain like, you know, let's just say, for example, you guys submit a grant to a supporter and I let anybody see that grant, your competitors, anybody see that grant. That's not fair to you. And so I think we have to think about that. Mm -hmm. This is protected in certain cases, protected health information. And from a global perspective, right? From a global perspective, now that I'm on the other side of the pond, things are much different. Um, you know, there's all sorts of laws over here. We've got GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, those are things that we have to consider when we use this. But there is a question in here that Scott put in, um, and I'm going to tease it over to Andy and Kevin. It looks as though payments for ChatGPT are only linked to cryptocurrency. How does that translate to business company use? Hmm. I I was able to pay with a credit card. Yeah, so, same here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, you know, open AI, you know, when you subscribe to ChatGPT Plus, it's just a $20 a month credit card payment uh, at that point. So I'm not sure exactly if you want to provide more context, you know, on that. Um, but, you know, Pam, to your point, you know, Italy, you know, quickly shut down access to ChatGPT because of a most of the things that we're talking about here as far as, you know, you know, privacy and everything else that's out there. Um, you know, and I think there's other countries that are looking at either putting guidelines around it or boundaries around it. You know, I think ultimately at the end of the day, I, I agree with you, Andy, it's a great brainstormer. I wouldn't put all of my trade secrets into it. No. <laughs> by any stretch. You know, it, it, you've got to treat it like any, it, any other form of social media. What you put out, what you put into it is always going to exist after that. Anybody can probably find it and it can be released at a later date with your name attached to it because you put it in. So it's, it's treating it like Facebook or Instagram or, or LinkedIn. Um, and, and be wary that, that what you put into it could come back. So, you know, don't be searching for, you know, how to make a pipe bomb to disrupt a parade or something like that. It's, it's, Oh God, the it's, timing is really bad on yeah. that one. <laughs> it, oh yeah, sorry. And Andy, um, yeah, we're, we're streaming through YouTube, so now that's actually the case. So good luck. No. Oh, someone's knocking on my door. I, <laughs> um, I want to hear. Does anybody have any any questions? Can it do this? I just for fun, I, I asked it to. Um, uh, a prompt I put in while we were talking was create a crossword puzzle about using chat GPT in the continuing medical education world. It created a crossword puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can use it to create little games for learners. Uh, what type of, of in presentation game can be done for this? And it would give you some some uh, uh, thoughts about that. Uh, it also give you it has a complete code base. So it writes in Python and HTML, mm -hmm. CSS, Java. So where you can actually say, you know, acting as a, you know, a game creator, you know, right. write me a simulation game based upon these criteria and it will give you the code, you know, coming yeah. out of that. And do it in HTML so you could copy and paste that into any website. Right. Uh, any platform to do that. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's powerful in that way. And Brian, you're right. The, the, the people who are using it the most are coders because mm -hmm. they're the ones who built it and they see the, the potential in that. Um, but that's nothing that hasn't been going on for, for decades anyway. So, yeah. 
for sure. So one thing we we sort of been sorry. Oh, okay. Thanks, Scott. One thing we've been talking about a lot is sort of grant submissions, but I think the other thing is around accreditation, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to use ChatGP to help write your self study. So I I asked I asked ChatGPT what are the requirements for pharmaceutical industry funding of CME activities? And of course it says that he doesn't, ChatGP does not hold any personal views or opinions, but it says the CME activity must be accredited by a recognized accrediting body such as ACCME. We know that's not true. It doesn't have to be accredited. It doesn't have to be accredited. Um, it has to be fair and balanced, um, conducted. And so I, I think, again, I think we got to be careful because the other the other thing is like let's say let's say um, you're a surveyor or you're you, right you're a surveyor or you're on the ARC and you see I, I don't know if you see as a surveyor exactly what you put in your self study now exists on in a in a uh, uh, applica accreditation application because someone took it I think we're just going to be careful yeah. Yeah, I want to get I want to get real quick into uh, Dr. McGowan posted something about image generation, yeah. uh, which is which is fantastic. Dolly, um, uh, Mid Journey, yeah, Mid Journey uh, is working well for us on that. Bing actually has come out with one that I've used a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, Bing Image Creator, it'll tell you how to get there. It's free too. Um, Microsoft. And its investment came out with Microsoft Designer. You can you can request to be on the the uh, waiting list for that. Um, cre to create Instagram posts or LinkedIn posts or Facebook posts almost instantly, you can create greeting cards by telling it what you want, and and it will interpret your text and, and spit something out that you can then customize it. I, I used it for my wife's business the other day. Um, uh, Sean asks how we can stay up to date on AI products coming out. TikTok and Twitter, yes. Um, for those of you still on Twitter, um, there is a newsletter called Futurepedia that I subscribe to. It comes out once a week, uh, highlighting uh, the prominent AI tools that have come out that week and then some advances in other AI. It's a free one, newsletter that comes out. One of the ones I use is there's a newsletter called Ben's Bytes, B E N, yeah. yes, Bytes. Um, and that's a five minute read, comes out daily. Um, warning is you will get a flood. You, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of apps coming onto the market mm -hmm. uh, right now. One thing with Midjourney um, and some of the other image creators, uh, Midjourney version five is actually doing such high-end photorealistic, but you have to remind it that humans have five fingers sometimes. You know, you, you gotta do something <laughs> like that. So, and there's also, there's not been strong cases of copyright that's been presented. Um, but there has been that question that's like, really look at the terms of service, make sure you use the professional versions if you're using it in, in production. There's so, a, uh, there's so, a TikTok Andrea, creator. That wants to Andy, jump in, you guys. Andy, while, while, while humans only have five fingers, we only have 60 minutes for these sessions of CME. <laughs> so we are actually running up against time. Uh, you know, the question is, how can we stay up to date? Well, this may come back as a session during CME flus of fall because this is moving so fast and there's so much information out there and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, so for those folks who are watching live or the recorded version of this, please complete our quick survey. Uh, we may put the survey results into chat GPT to help us uh, develop sessions for the fall and for future meetings. So uh, please go on and do that. Um, to view the next session for those who are watching live, no need to refresh your browser. Just look on our live page and click the appropriate session link. It'll start shortly. So with that, I would like to thank Kevin and Andy and Pam and everybody who entered in comments on YouTube. It's great. It makes it much easier for us to kind of show the questions. Um, so I'm glad everybody was able to use that. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we will see you all soon. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you.